Welcome to the private reading by Lyme Events of her translation of the work of Matilda Okanada at the home of Sandra Clev in Anchorage, Alaska. The life and work of Matilda Okanada, a Jewish poet, murdered in Lithuania in 1941, was compiled in a book on the young murdered woman's life titled The Unlocked Diary, the Diary and Poems of Matilda Okanade. People attended this event held on June 3rd, 2021, in person and on Zoom. A question and answer session is held after the reading with an introduction of the people in attendance and their histories. Svata Worthington, accredited by the U.S. Department of State as the Honorary Consul from the State of Alaska, Republic of Lithuania, works to promote relations between Alaska and Lithuania. She unites people in the Lithuanian community in Anchorage and Alaska and seeks to locate more Alaskans of Lithuanian descent. Therefore, it was an especially exciting occurrence to have people identify with the translator, Lyme Vins, and the audience members, so many of whom had an opportunity to tell their stories. My name is Cynthia Steele, Assistant Editor of Cirque Creative Arts Journal of the Pacific Rim, volunteering to do some photography and videotaping of this event. In introduction, I share a few of my photographs of the gathering. The event was covered by Charlie Sokaitis for Alaska News Source. Found in translation, the thoughts and poems of Holocaust victim Matilda Okanada carry on thanks to Lyme events. Okanada was a child prodigy who spoke five languages was first published at nine years old and continues, continued to write until she was killed by occupying Nazi forces in a forest outside of her village. Um, this is Lima Vince. Uh, she has spent the winter in Lithuania uh, working on her dissertation and publishing her book on the young poet, Matilda Okinaita, about which she'll speak tonight. And I, I met Lima on Zoom last July when she did a presentation of Victoria's poetry. I was so taken by it that I contacted Lima by email and she answered me right away. We've been corresponding that way throughout the year. And she just got back from the thing, I think, a week ago. A week ago, oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and um, she was quarantined there. Um, COVID took quite a toll there, I think, more than here. Lima Vince. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this week, June 6th, Matilda would have been 99 years old had she survived. Her birthday is June, June 6th. So we're honoring her by um, meeting, meeting tonight. Um, Matilda was a, a Lithuanian Jewish girl. She was 19 years old when she was killed during the Holocaust in Lithuania. Um, she was a brilliant poet, as you'll hear tonight, and her dream was for her poetry to be heard, for her voice to be heard, and um, you'll learn all about her history through the, the reading tonight, um, but really by listening to her poetry and hearing her voice, we are bringing Matilda back and all the talented people who were murdered in the Holocaust and who lost their lives before they were able to um, reach adulthood, many of them, or fulfill, fulfill their, their life dreams. So thank you very much for being here. And I think what, what I'll do is I'm going, to, um, I'm going to read a performance piece that tells you the story of Matilda and her family um, and I will share poems of Matilda's that are in English translation and excerpts of her diary. It kind of works as a uh, narrative. And then I thought after my presentation, we can open up the floor to a discussion. You can ask me questions. Um, one of the really interesting aspects of working on a book such as this one is the process of um, doing research. I had the honor of spending time with two people who were close to Matilda when she was still alive, who were her childhood friends. And um, I was very much also inspired by Dr. Irena Vesaita, who is a Holocaust survivor, uh, literature professor, and who really held on to and saved the notebook of poems and the diary um, for many, many years. Sadly, 
uh, Irana de Saida passed away from COVID-19 in December um, at the age of 92. And Lucia, Matilda's close childhood friend and really one of the last people alive who remembered her, who remembered her vividly and was able to recite from memory um, a few poems of Matilda's that had been lost. She also died in Lithuania of COVID-19 um, in November, in late November. So, you know, we were really hard hit by the pandemic. And um, so we'll remember um, Lucia and Irana and Matilda and that beautiful generation of women who had such spirit and such life and just refused to allow their inner light to be extinguished in a time of darkness. And I think that's the inspiration for us as we navigate through a pandemic and through so many tumultuous um, events. Okay, so I'll get started. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Because if you can't, I have a backup here. Okay. On a beautiful hot day in early July, 1941, at a bend in the Sheydukishkes village road that leads out of Panemonenes towards Kavolishkes, the white armbanders, these are local Lithuanian Nazi collaborators, arrived on bicycles. They left their bicycles in the forest across the road from an isolated farmstead that belonged to the farmer, Patras Shakalskis. They began digging a ditch. <clears throat> Tree roots prevented them from digging very deep. So they gave up and took their shovels to the other side of the road and began digging in the peat bog that belonged to the Kawalishkis Manor. The grass grew lush there, but recently the farmers had harvested the hay, leaving the field flat and empty. Then they left, only to return shortly afterwards riding their bicycles alongside a wagon load of people pulled by two horses over the rutted road. An armed guard sat at the front of the wagon and another in the back. More armed men rode alongside the wagon on bicycles. The captives were blindfolded and their heads were bound. When the wagon reached an incline, the captives were ordered to climb out and walk the rest of the distance. At gunpoint, they were led towards the crest of the hill where the field meets dense forest. <clears throat> the guards beat them with clubs as they trudged and stumbled up the hill. Hidden behind a haystack, an eight-year-old girl named Aldona watched. She was the daughter of the local farmer, Patra Sherkowskis. Their hired laborer, Bronis, ran to find the farmer to tell him what was happening. The farmer came into the yard and climbed up onto the hay rack. The farmer, his little girl, and the hired hand soon could no longer see what was happening, but they could hear the screams and cries, which continued for a few hours before the final gunshots came. This is a poem by Matilda Orkinaita, 1940. The Cerulean Bird. Off in the distant skies soared the cerulean bird, flying endlessly ecstatic, singing a golden hymn about happiness eternal, joy that cannot be broken, a smile that never ceases. Alongside barns, hillocks, through forests, deserts, with heavy footsteps, the giant made his way with a bitter glance, scanning the landscape, searching for the cerulean bird who flew along the heavens singing a golden hymn about happiness eternal. Off in the distant skies soared the cerulean bird and three hour arrows pierced her carrying black death within and they tore open the breast of the cerulean bird and the heavens were shattered and not with the ecstatic hymn about happiness eternal but with the cry of the cerulean bird, her last trembling breath, her bottomless longing. Oh, the quivering bow, why ever did you release that most poisoned arrow? Who will sing now about happiness eternal, ecstasy that never ceases, and a hymn that rings 
forever. That day, no one dared approach the killing site. The next day, Mrs. Shatkowskas and a neighbor, Mr. Vaitkanichus, walked across the field to take a look. They found a shallow grave. Shatkowskas pushed his rake handle into the earth. The bodies were covered with only a few centimeters of soil. He covered the bodies with more soil and branches forming a burial mound. Before the Oikinas family was killed, Noapas Oikinas managed to pass his daughter's diary and notebook of poems to his friend, Father Matelonis. The priest hid the diary inside the great altar of the Panamoneras church. Three years later, the Soviets drove the Germans out of Lithuania. But in 1950, Father Matelonis was deported to a prison camp in Siberia. He was deported because he was a Catholic priest and because he had resisted the Nazis. The diary and the notebook of poems remained hidden for years. <clears throat> In the 80s, still during the Soviet occupation, the church organist, a linguist, Alfredas Andriauskas, recovered Matilda's notebook of poems and her diary when Father Matilonis told him about this hiding place. <clears throat> he brought the diary and the notebook for safekeeping to Holocaust survivor and professor of literature, Dr. Irena de Saida. She hid the poems in the diary in her apartment. Um, at that time, it was still 1985, 1986, had Matilda's work been found, it would have been considered anti-Soviet and could not be published. And whoever was hiding this work could be arrested and, and could have trouble for possessing it. Irena recalls, quote, this man dressed as a villager showed up at my door. His hands were work-worn and his clothing was ragged, but I saw in him great intellect and a purity of spirit that was rare in those days. He told me he was the organist at the Panemoneris church. He told me the story of how the priest had saved Matilda's handwritten poetry collection and diary by hiding them beneath the altar. When Father Matilonis was arrested by the Soviets and ex exiled to Siberia, the poems were in danger of being lost. In that moment, I felt Matilda's spirit in a very powerful way. I felt that Matilda's spirit had come back and was asking me to share her poems with the world. Matilda was only a few years older than me. I had survived the Holocaust, she had not. When I first read Matilda's poetry, I cried. I kept thinking, why is she dead and I am alive? I felt guilty. This is a feeling people who have survived this Holocaust have. Everyone is dead, but you're alive. Irena kept the diary and poems safe for 30 years. In the autumn of 2017, I visited Irena and took photos of the pages of the poems and diary with my phone so that I could translate them. I could only think that if I had died so young, just as I was beginning to find my voice as a poet, I would have wanted someone to find my notebook and to share my poems with the world. It is my wish to translate for my, it is my, it is my wish for my translations to breathe life back into these poems written out long ago with a fountain pen on the brittle yellow pages of an old school notebook. Poetry speaks to us at our deepest level of humanity. Poetry speaks to our souls. To experience a poem, to live through a poem, one must access the poem through emotion. Matilda absorbed the tumultuous times she lived in through the language of poetry. Matilda was barely 19 years old when she was murdered. She'd only just begun to find her voice as a poet. And yet, being so young, she documented the horror of her times and expressed it through poetry. She perceived the impending danger of the Holocaust and at the same time sensed the fundamental tragedy of humanity that repeats itself age after age. Despite it all, 
she reveled in the fragile beauty of a provincial life. It was a time of shadow, but also a time of light. It was a time of shattering contrasts, good and evil playing out on the world stage. July 14, 1938, from Matilda's poem. The sun expired, the sun died, and you died along with the sun. And now you lie and gaze at the violence and the butterflies among the blooms. The Olkinas family lived near the train station in the village of Panemonielis. Noakas Olkinas was the local pharmacist. He was well known to the community for his kindness, often administering medicine to the sick free of charge. Mr. Olkinas would say to his customers, only pay me if your medicine helps you get better. He was an intellectual who read Pushkin, Lermontov, and Dostoevsky. Noakas Olkinas was Jewish. He was a Litvak. He was a close friend of the Catholic parish priest, Josephus Maternonis. They drank tea together in the rectory every Saturday, Sunday afternoon after mass. Both practiced religious tolerance. In the 1930s, as a gesture of friendship to Father Maternonis, Joachim Olkinitz donated an ornately carved oak confessional to the Panemonianus Church. <clears throat> the confessional is still in use there today. Asta and Noachas Olkinas had four children, Iria, born in 1919, Matilda, born 1922, Mika, born 1925, and Grune, born 1930. Matilda was well known in the Rokishkis region as a gifted poet. She wrote her poems in Lithuanian and from the age of 13 published in Lithuanian literary journals. She was often invited to recite her poems at literary evenings in Rokishkis and then later in Vilnius, where she studied French and Russian literature at Vilnius University in the years 1940-1941. Those were the last years of Matilda's life. Matilda's friends recalled that Matilda was warm, sincere, but at the same time reserved. During breaks between classes, she would walk the corridors deep in thought. She would pause and gaze out the window. When her friends saw her like this, they would say, shush, be quiet. Matilda is composing poetry. In the summer of 2018, I spent an afternoon with 93-year-old Lucia Nemishkita Vizgirdiana in the Vilnius neighborhood of Jirinas. Lucia's grandparents lived across the yard from the Olkinas family and operated a mill. As a child, Lucia became the best friend of Mika and Matilda. She would spend her summers and holidays with the Olkinas family. On Saturdays, both the Jewish family and their Lithuanian friends and neighbors observed the Sabbath together. At Sabbath dinner, the children would read, put on plays, and entertain the guests. Matilda's early poems were full of exuberance and love of nature. <clears throat> Lucia remembers Matilda's father encouraged creativity and self-expression in his children. I'm not sure whether he was serious or half-joking, Lucia recalled, but Mr. Onkinos would say to Matilda, I want to read a new poem written by you every Sabbath. Matilda would sit up in the attic and compose her poems. One day, Mika came up with a plan. Let's be Matilda's muses, she said. We dressed up in long dresses and wrapped ourselves in shawls. We climbed up into the attic and twirled around Matilda, calling out, we are your muses, we are your muses. We're here to inspire your poetry. Excerpt from Matilda's diary, August 17. 1940. I hear a cricket singing. He took up residence with us tonight. They say that crickets bring good luck. So there, good fortune has come to live with us, to work and to create and to love and to be loved. Matilda's poem, An Idle Evening. Evening comes and howls under your window calling longing in a creaking voice. What to expect you no longer know when under the window sits blue warnings poise. Evening comes carrying the ancient moon and a crackling star glistens beyond the window. 
Somewhere behind the stove is the cricket's abode, and under the floor lives a quick small mouse. Longing comes carrying an old violin and plays a serenade under the window. And how could you ever ask him to leave when he is so sad and so polite? And you feel so hopelessly sorry for yourself when longing plays its song on the windowsill and it all seems so ridiculous to you, the mouse, the moon, the cricket. And it seems to you that you've gone mad and even turned to poetry. When gazing at the moon, you sigh hopelessly. Lucia. Guys, I'm afraid we've lost the volume. It's been turned off entirely. Oh, maybe I should sit closer to you. No, it's, it's okay. Okay. Maybe go back a couple of yeah. so we can right. request. So, thank you. All right. The last time Lucia saw Matilda alive was when she went to visit her in the room she rented across the street from the synagogue on Piedema Street in Vilnius. Matilda told Lucia, that she had dedicated a poem to her and that she should look for it in a certain magazine. That day, Lucia recited the poem from memory. The poem was written by Matilda on the day Lucia's family's home and mill in Panemoneles was confiscated, privatized by the Soviets and the family was forced to leave. Your tiny room was white, filled with sunlight. And your shutters were white too. You dried mint on your windowsill. Every spring you picked violets and kept them in water on your table. And every night you wound your ancient clock. Tell me why that night the wind blew out your candle. Who rapped on your window, paused a moment and then left? It was your fate calling, knocking, quietly on your white shutters. It stopped your old clock. It snuffed out your white candle. Your tiny room was white, filled with sunlight, but the world is so wide. Where will you go, beloved? Matilda showed Lucia a pair of beautiful, expensive checkmate shoes. She smiled and said, my love gave me these. Lucia asked if Sheretz, the son of the Rokishkis pharmacist, gave her the shoes. This was the young, the nice young Jewish boy that her parents wanted her to marry. Oh no, my true love, Matilda answered mysteriously. Lucia remembers Matilda was very happy that day. She was content with her life. That is how she likes to remember her. A few weeks later, the Germans occupied Lithuania and Matilda's young life of love and poetry was cut short. Matilda's poem, My People. A pair of dark eyes ignite once again with a pain that cannot be extinguished. And they, they just keep walking past and away. But for me, Lord, there are no words. Do you hear? Do you hear that awful laughter? The hills, even the hills shake with the sound and the rivers will faint and the seas will faint and the stone will cry 
the stone will cry. You are laughing. You walk past and keep on walking. But for me, Lord, there are no words for my horror. That laughter, that awful laughter, and dark eyes flash with an undying, relentless pain. As early as 1938, Matilda began to write about her premonitions that a terrible fate will befall the Jewish people. In March 1940, she wrote this poem in her notebook, a Jewish lullaby. <clears throat> My tiny little baby, why won't you fall asleep? Longing overwhelms you tonight. Longing crouches beside your cradle. The nights are long and dark, and the road leads far into the distance. On such a night, you will leave me, my tiny little baby. And suffering will wait for you, like a beloved friend beside the gate. Great suffering and hardship will carry you silently through long generations. Long generations carry suffering from the cradle to the grave, suffering immense and deep and as endless as the night. Fall asleep now. It is a long road that will lead you into the night. Go to sleep. I will sing to you, my tiny little baby. Sometimes in her diary, Matilda confused her premonitions with her anxieties over the young man she elusively referred to as her love, or simply him, written with a capital H. From Matilda's diary, August 15, 1940. It's been a strange summer this year. Every goodbye is painful, and it seems as though everything is passing and will soon be gone forever. When I parted with my love, I felt as though I'll never see him again. I walked home from the station late at night. The moon was full and so bright that you could read a book by its light. A long shadow trailed after me as I walked. And it seemed as though this were the last night of summer, bright and humid and restless to the point of tears. Often he does not even see me and he doesn't understand me. I asked him to write something for me. He took that as my whim and wouldn't write anything. But I so wanted to have a few words that I could take away from this evening, which felt as though it were our last together. I wanted to read a poem to him in French today, but already by the second line, I sensed that he was not interested. So I stopped reading. After such moments, when he becomes serious and asks me if I would agree to leave everything behind and run away with him, the sound of his words are painful to me and I feel as though he were mocking me. It's no good. It can't be that love will always be like this for me. Before, I always thought, <clears throat> or perhaps I was just trying to convince myself that my feelings will always match his, which were unknown to me then. He is not keeping a diary now. He sleeps soundly. I wish him well. Matilda's young man, her diary reveals, showed her affection and then withheld it. Matilda impetuously penned this poem between diary entries eight months before her death. Her handwriting is rushed as though she wrote the poem hastily, expressing emotions weighing on her. Or was it a premonition? Or was she frightened by the war that was drawing closer and closer to Lithuania? Oh, how many have gathered in my home of mourning. I hold an infant in my arms, and my infant is deaf. They brought a silver sash and armfuls of lilies white, and I cannot thank them. I cannot smile. All around me are lilies white, white, and faces wearing bright smiles. But my hands are so cold, a black ribbon is tied in my hair. Someone has trampled my love, the whitest of the white blossoms. And among the wilted lilies, I see them, I speak to them. Oh, how many have gathered, and no one will see love. I hold an infant in my arms, and my infant is deaf. 
Many of Matilda's poems express a premonition of death, but on the pages of her diary, Matilda would often ponder the meaning of life. September 11, 1940. I'm thinking now about what a person's natural state of being is, whether it is to live a simple gray everyday life where we approach things with a light and open touch, or whether it is to live in an enlightened state of being, where between us and phenomenon, a deeper feeling arises that raises the level of our thoughts, which gives everything meaning, placing it all on a higher plane. Is a person's nature gray and mundane, and only very rarely does it rise into a higher spiritual plane? Or is it full of light, call it sacred, and only by force push down into the level of gray everyday existence. And where is the true me? Is it the me who gossips about others, chatters away, gets angry, has little patience? Or is it the me who rises above and who creates and who loves, who trembles in eternal bliss when the evening spreads across the wide fields and the heavens overhead are wide open and endless and when in the sacred silence, you hear the word of God speaking to you. What is the natural state of a human being? Perhaps both are natural to us, just like hate and love, like destruction and creativity, like keeping watch and sleeping. In her diary, Matilda wrote about her family, their shared moments of warmth, but also their squabbles. Despite the Soviet occupation, Matilda hoped to one day publish a collection of her poems. On September 1st, 1940, Matilda noted, today it is exactly one year since the war began. The newspapers have marked the occasion by writing their headlines all in capital letters. It is horrific when you think about it, but I'm not taking it to heart. She continues in that same diary entry. The day that I must leave is drawing closer. This is she has to go away to university. This year, I will need to study hard and put all my energy into my work. I am considering studying Slavic languages as an elective, but I will give it some more thought. Maybe, whatever I end up choosing, I would like to work very seriously at my studies this year. I'd like to improve my grade in the Lithuanian language. I will need to take a few exams. And then, and then, I wish to publish my book. I want to re resolve my relationship with him. If I see that we do not have that thing called Walshavanschaft, then I will sacrifice everything and step aside. Um, the complication here is that the young man she's in love with is Lithuanian, and she's Jewish, and Nazis are in Poland and at the gates. And so that causes a lot of conflict in their, in their relationship. A few days later, on September 4, 1940, Matilda expressed doubts about her collection of poems. She observed that her poems were not consistent with the dominating Soviet ideology and feared that her poems would never be published. Quote, today I shouldn't write in my diary. It has been a day without sadness and without joy. I read a book in three hours. I walked around in my bathrobe all day, my throat hurt, the battery in my radio died. What I should do is sit down and work on editing several poems. Oh, that poetry collection of mine. I'm working on it with no inspiration, knowing that no one will publish it anyway. There is nothing in my poems that is relevant. I write about the pain of suffering over centuries at a time when we are required to sing about how happy we are today and about our bright tomorrow. At a time when Lithuania's most beloved poets, Solomea Neris, had succumbed under the weight of the first Soviet occupation and began writing odes to Stalin, mm -hmm. Matilda was true to her poetic vision. Even knowing that it was unlikely that her collection of poems would be published because she refused to change her artistic vision to suit the politics of the times, she continued writing in her own voice, never compromising her artistic or moral integrity. In a diary entry dated August 29, 1940, 
Matilda criticizes the Lithuanian poets who wrote social realist verses honoring Stalin. Times are awful. The world has spilled out into the streets. People shove a red handkerchief into their pockets and shout, Salomea Neres, Ludas Giras. I cannot fathom how normal people can write that way. There are banners and more banners everywhere. The biggest communist, if ever there were such a one who is a cultured person, would not be able to stand it. I often think about how people lack culture. It's sad. Could it even be possible for communism and its ideology to be expressed in poems that are not dom dominated by destruction, but by creativity? Not by hatred, but by love. In her diary, Matilda writes about how she disliked the Soviet regime because she felt they were common because they tried to control artists. Yet her brother, Ilya, joined the communist youth, quite possibly out of idealism. Matilda notes in her diary with irony, we received a letter from Ilya. It was a patriotic letter about our Soviet homeland. Ilya is one of those enlightened people who believes in communism. As 1940, the first year of the Soviet occupation of Lithuania progresses, the wish to lead an ordinary life becomes a pervasive theme in Matilda's diary. November 20th, 1940. If only I had a baby to care for, I would calm down. Not because I would beat down all my passion, but because I would have someone to give all my fire, all my love, all my life. I would like a healthy, beautiful baby, one with brown eyes or with blue eyes like his. A healthy, beautiful baby. That would be my compensation for my difficult, heavy days, for all my days of longing, all my restless nights. On August 31st, 1940, Matilda wrote in her diary, I went to a dance this evening. I danced and I danced and I danced as though I wanted to dance all the away, as though I wanted to dance away all the pain in my soul. By the fall of 1940, Lithuania had been incorporated into the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was an ally of Nazi Germany at that time. However, the incongruity of their alliance was apparent to all, and fears of the war reaching Lithuania grew. Matilda's poems became more preoccupied with the impending doom that she sensed was coming to her country and to the Jewish people. She longed to utter one single word that could bring all the world back to its senses. A word, Matilda's poem. It is so difficult for me. I'd like to utter just one word. That unspoken word trembles within me. I see processions, generations gliding past and a blue longing and shivering suffering and joy quivering in tiny rays of light and the pain of an eon of shattered hopes. But I am that unspoken word and shadow. I carry that unspoken word in my heart. It is so difficult for me. I'd like to utter that one word, just one word for the crowds and for the nations. The processions would pause. Time would come to a halt. All the generations would stop and listen. And my word would flutter above the mountains and the seas, above flowing rivers and rough waters. And longing and trembling suffering would cease and the pain of an eon of shattered hope. In a poem written June 27, 1940, Matilda envisions death as the grim reaper, who according to Lithuanian folklore, takes on human form and comes to collect his due. All the skips have foundered and mine will sink as well. Death is wading through troubled waters. 
And death bade me sing my final hymn. And death bade me dance my final dance. And so I sing my hymn to the seagulls and the swells. The azure heavens listen, and I sing to them too. And the sea carries my skiff through a window, carries me away to sleep, and will pull me under. Tonight, death wanders through restless waters. The sun has sunk already, and my skiff will sink as well. Matilda knew that World War II would impact her generation directly. In a poem written on October 11, 1939, shortly after World War II began, titled simply for my dear idealist, Matilda expresses the fears that every young woman faced knowing that the man she loved may be called to war. For my dear idealist, the sun has drowned in the sea and you, what awaits you? The world's road is bloody without love, without heart. The sun has drowned in the sea and the night will be dark. Oh, but your eyes are brilliant and full of love, full of heart. The sun has drowned in the sea beyond blue hills. Will you return our sun? Will you bring her back? The world's path is bloody without love, without heart. Perhaps your brilliant eyes will lead us to the sun. In a poem dated October 19, 1938, Matilda describes the vision that the sun, her symbol of hope, joy, life, is carried off beyond the three hills by a black angel. Below the poem, she scribbled a notation written during the gnosiology lesson. I can only imagine that Matilda quickly penned this poem during a lecture, moved by intuition or perhaps the contents of the lecture. I did not know what gnosiology is, so I looked it up. Gnosiology is the philosophy and study of knowledge. <clears throat> Beyond three hills, the sun went down. It was dusk when we set out. A black angel carried off the sun. Beyond three hills, the sun has set. Farewell, farewell, we will never return. We've already gone beyond the three hills and we did not find there our beloved sun. We only found the dark night. Beyond three hills, the sun has set. Oh, farewell, farewell, we will never return. And flowers will bloom in the early morning. In the early morning, we will never return. Thank you. <laughs> Something that her childhood friends remember about her, that she was always singing Lithuanian folk songs and Yiddish folk songs. Um, I love to sing the Korean folk songs. I've been singing with, I sung with different folk groups. And so when I started translating her poems, I recognized those rhythms and repetitions and how you have these certain symbols like the sun, um, the moon that, that keep coming back. And so it's really her poetry is so unique because she takes two cultural histories and, and, and blends them together into this. Union synthesis. So, I did you discover her? Oh, uh -huh. I don't know her. Um, the story behind that, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I'm wondering in America now. I mean, there's so many levels of serendipity to this story that it's just, it's just mind blowing. It feels like it was fate. Um, because there were for two years, it was like 2017 to 2019, I was teaching at a, um, an American cultural exchange program in Beijing, China. So I was like, yeah, so I was living in this very intense life in Beijing, teaching a course um, on Chinese literature, learning how to speak Chinese, working with students. But I was, um, you know, I just finished writing my dissertation in. Um, 
for Vilnius University. My dissertation is memory and post-memory about of written by North American writers of Lithuanian descent. So it's all post-memory work and, and um, historical narratives. And my friend, Phil Shapiro, who is of Litvak background, but his family um, left Lithuania before World War II, he wrote me an email because according to my, I mean, I was researching my dissertation while teaching, but I had to every year in October for two weeks, I'd have to fly back to Lithuania and take exams and meet with the, the committee at the university and, and so on and so forth. And so Phil knew that I was planning to go back to Lithuania and he writes me this email and he says, look, he says, if you are in Lithuania in um, October, there's this brilliant young um, playwright named Neringa Daniena. She runs a community theater in this provincial town, Rokishkis, and she's put together this wonderful documentary play about a, a young, Litvak poet named Matilda Kenaita, and the entire play is, is her diaries and her poems and so on. And interestingly enough, I have another layer of serendipity that my um, great aunt had passed away. And when her daughter was cleaning out her, her home, she found this old suitcase. So when she opened it up, we found in a suitcase my great grandfather's diaries that he wrote in 1952 oh after having a stroke and telling his whole life story because he, like Svaya's heritage, um, he had been very much involved in um, rebuilding Lithuania during the first independence after 1918. And he wrote about in great detail about his life growing up in this small village. So lo and behold, the small village my grandfather's family came from for generations and that he grew up in is just a few kilometers away from Matilda's village. And so I'm thinking like, oh, this is great. I'll, I'll go and see this play and then I could also go to that village and you know, and isn't that wonderful? And um, so I took a, a friend of mine who she's uh, a close friend of, she's a Lithuanian um, professor of ethnography. So she's, she's an anthropologist, ethnographer. Like, oh, come along with me, you might find this interesting. And we're you know, driving out in the pouring rain to, um, to this region where this community theater play was going to take place. And because of the rain, and there seemed to be like some, you know, motorcycle rally going on. And we were like, oh, we got stuck behind like hundreds of Harley Davidson oh by the time. So we were supposed to, because Phil Shapiro had set it up that we would get there early, we would meet the director of the play, we'd have a conversation. But we, we got there just as the lights were going down. And we sat in our seats. And just like when I heard Matilda's poems, um, performed on stage. I, I was just like my friend, we were sitting there sobbing. The whole audience was sobbing. Um, you know, and they're, they're, her Lithuanian, the way she uses the Lithuanian language, so beautiful. And she really, really, she was very gifted. She spoke five languages. She spoke Russian, Yiddish, Lithuanian, German, and French. But she chose, she loved the Lithuanian language and she chose to write in Lithuanian. So, I mean, we were just, just hearing her and and the play, I mean, it was a community theater group, but what was fascinating was that some of the actors were actual descendants of people who had been alive at that time and they lived in the same village. And so we're, we're you know, both just like sitting there crying and, and like, thank goodness nobody could see us because we've got tears streaming down our faces. And, um, and the play ends and the director comes on stage and she's, she's always emotional, she was emotional as well. And uh, she said a few words about the play. And then she says, well, so my friend Phil Shapiro wrote to me and said, there's a Lithuanian American poetry translator in the audience. And, and um, I hope that she will translate all these poems into English. And I'm, like, ah, ah, ah. I'm like, oh, thank God we were late because if we had met her before and she would have had to go up on stage. I'm like, oh my goodness. And then I thought to myself, because you know when you translate Poetry, it's almost like you're channeling the poet. It's yeah. very interesting. I can't translate just anybody's poetry. I have to have this, this connection. So I thought, will I be able to translate this poetry? Like, well, it moves me so deeply. I feel like, like I, I will. So that was, so then I went, I spoke to Neringa Daniela, the playwright. And I said, yeah, I'll translate the poems. And she said, well, she said, you have to go see Irana de Saita, the Holocaust survivor, because the notebook of poems and the diary is with, is with her and you know and she said but she's a very private person and she doesn't let anybody in so you're going to have to figure out a way to convince her to let you in to her apartment and I'm thinking oh what am I going to do 
It turns out that a close friend of mine of 30 years lives next door to it at the base <laughs> and, because, and she had worked with her. But, you know, years ago, George Soros started this um, democracy fund in Lithuania, and, and, and Irena was the director of it, and my friend Daiva was her assistant, so she knew her. And being her neighbor, she was, you know, because Irena was getting older, she would help out with groceries, dinner, you know, errands. So she's like, sure, I'll introduce you. So now I have, you know, I've got an introduction. Um, so everything just kept falling into, into place. And actually, the, when we saw the play, then we stayed overnight. And then um, a local historian who, who actually, she was the first one to research um, the story of the Olkinos family and, and how they were murdered by these local collaborators. Um, they were actually separated from the other Jewish families that were arrested and they were taken to the remote location and they were murdered because these people thought that they, because he was the pharmacist that he would have gold and that, you know, it was a horrible, horrible thing. And this, you know, so this historian came to meet us, Nettinga called her, she came to meet us in the morning and um, she was an older woman and she told us that her mother was a, was a school teacher and that her mother was a teacher in the years, like in the 1950s and 60s. And then at that time in the village, they talked a lot about the Olkinos family because they were very important in that village and about the murders. And that it was that it, the village had never really recovered from it. That there it was just like, if you can imagine you live in a small town and you have this mass murder of this delightful, lovely family, you know, who are pillars of the community. And there was another family murdered along with them. And so she said that she had grown up with that story. And so she had researched it and she had found people who had known the family. And she was the one who found the woman who was, as a nine-year-old girl, hiding behind the haystack, witnessed the murder. And actually the Holocaust Museum interviewed this woman. She, she passed away about 10 years ago, but I was able to see a video recording of of her telling the story on, in the Holocaust Museum um, archives. So, so the historian took us to, um, she took us to this, the, the site where the murders happened. And then this is another remarkable part of the story that the actors in the theater group, um, there was the grave, it wasn't even marked, it wasn't a grave. It was just this desolate part of, on the outskirts of the village and local people refer to that area as the Sahara Desert because like nothing really grows there. It's just a lot of underbrush. And so um, the men and women in this theater group, they actually built um, a memorial to the Oikinos family and they did it very tastefully. They, um, they got a large stone and they carved their names um, in Hebrew and in Lithuanian, and they just, they cleared out the area. They made it very nice. And they did this completely as volunteers. Nobody gave them any money. They all just pooled their resources and um, they all did the work together. And it was another thing that was so moving is that local people, um, you know, based on the eyewitness accounts um, were able to um, find the place and then they built this, this memorial. And so, you know, it was all these like, just this, all these levels of serendipity that I just felt like it was just something that, that I had to do, that I had to translate her work so mm -hmm. that um, really so that more people can um, enjoy it than just the 3 million Lithuanian speakers in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so we started working with the Institute of Lithuanian Literature and Folklore and um, you know, to put together a book in Lithuanian and in um, English. And I think the book designer did a beautiful job because, you know, she included in the book, here's like the diary. You get to see what it looked like, right? Yeah, and then she included, um, she had a photographer take photographs of, um, you know, the back of the diary and what the pages looked like. Um, she also had included the notebook of poems. So this is like the, the handwritten notebook of poems. Mm -hmm. So it's like the book designer put her heart and soul into um, mm -hmm. the project also, you know, and then there were researchers from the Rokishkis Museum where the region, that's the region that um, Matilda came from. So they, I had said, you know, 
I said, well, somebody, I mean, actually the Smithsonian um, Magazine came and did a piece about Matilda and the story. And I was kind of like their, their translator and their researcher. And when we were, you know, I was helping them with that piece, the photographer made this comment and he said, oh, you're making such a big deal out of Matilda because she, she died young and she was killed, but really all teenagers write poems and notebooks. It's nothing, it's nothing really that special. And I said, well, no. Is this the guy who's the story is telling you this? Yeah, well, it was actually, yeah. <laughs> it was actually his, the photographer. So the photographer was just taking photographs. He, he was, was just hired. By, okay. Yeah, he was yeah, hired. Yeah. He was hired yeah, by the Yeah, I had, um, you know, I'm working with Sistonia and a number. You had some weird stuff like that. And, and <laughs> some good people. And I just, <laughs> just thought a little weird. No, no, no. This was, And he wasn't saying it to be mean. He was no. just kind of like, he was, he was just like, he actually was very interested. But he was just like thinking out loud. And, and he posed that question. And it's a viable question because it's true. I teach... English, I've taught English for years, and it is true that young adults will write emotional poems to work through there. And so he's thinking in his head, yeah. like, well, maybe that's all this was. And, you know, and and you and all these Lithuanians are making a big deal out of this, <laughs> you know, and it's really not such a big deal. And I said, well, wait a minute, no. I said, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm a poet, and, you know, I have an MFA in poetry, and, and I, you know, you know, and I've, I've worked with poetry translation, and I can see that the poetry yeah. is not just a girl writing about her feelings. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. it's structured. It has rhythm, and it's rhyme, and it's deep thought. It has allusions to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it has you know Lithuanian folk music. It has so much, you know. And so, you know, and then I thought, like, how are we ever going to prove this? Mm -hmm. So. The, the historians at the Rokishkis Museum who were associated with this theater group, they started digging through the archives. And it was amazing because what they found were all the original publications where she had been published. Oh my gosh. So now we had physical evidence wow. because we had those publications. And it was remarkable because just like the Nazis burned books, the Soviet burned. Yes. So they burned any books or magazines that revealed any sense of patriotism or nationalism. And, but they managed to find surviving copies. So now we had um, physical publications from age nine upwards, you know. And then there were other people, like there was, um, you know, uh, the editor of the book is Mindelvas Kwiatkowskis, and he actually found the poem The Cerulean Bird because that was one of that was only in um, a newspaper we didn't have it in the notebook. And then her friend Lucia remembered and recited a poem. Mm -hmm. So it became like, and it was almost like kind of wonderful because more and more people kept jumping in and going out and you know finding different pieces of, of the puzzle. And so here's like the, the inside the book, you have all the documents. You have her, you know, her school certificates, um, birth certificate written in, in Hebrew. Um, so, you know, it became really, I guess, um, in, in, in literary criticism, this book would be called an ego document, which I think is a bizarre <laughs> name, but it's a, it's a theoretical term and it means, you know, diary, it means poetry, it means, everything about about a person but the idea was so they have the identical book is in Lithuanian and it's in English and the idea was just that you know to bring her back to life because you know and I, I really felt that that her um that her voice had been taken away from her mm -hmm. you know and here's another really interesting part of the story is that the way book publishing works in Lithuania mm -hmm. is that um publishers apply for grants from the government. So the government has funds to pay for publishing. So, you know, so like this publisher would write a grant and, you know, and then they get funding and they, they, they do the book. But um, I was in, in um, China and I, you know, we were waiting to find out if we had been given grant money, that the publisher had received the money to, to you know, to publish this book. And then um, we, we look on the list of who received publish and publishing money and we see that this book did not receive any money. And I was so upset. And you know, it's hard to get on Facebook in China because it's all blocked, but we use VPNs. <laughs> and I don't know, I just got on Facebook and I wrote in Lithuanian, this like criticism of the cultural oh, fund, oh, just oh. total emotion. Like, 
like this is such an important book. This is a book that can heal the wound between you were writing ethnic Lithuanians and, yeah. and, 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 and Jewish Lithuanians and Catholic Protestant Lithuanians and Jewish Lithuanians. This is such a gaping wound because there were Lithuanian collaborators involved and 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 you know, and here we have this book that tells this beautiful story, and I can't believe it didn't get funded. I just went on a rant, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, like like maybe like a few minutes later, this one <laughs> Lithuanian poet writes, I'll give you 50 euro to publish this book. Oh. And then somebody else is like, I'll give you money, I'll give you money, and all these like people oh are posting. God. And I'm like, whoa, what do I do? And so um Nettinga, who uh, directs the theater group, she says, Well, I'll just put our theater group um, bank account number on your Facebook page and people could just deposit the money there. You know? so, so all these people started depositing money into that bank account. And we had we collected 10,000 10, euro in two weeks. Wow. Ten, that, that's an awful wow. lot of money. Yeah. But you know what it was like so much of that, a lot of that money was just regular people in Lithuania, ethnic Lithuanians who would donate it. And then in their you know, on the bank account, it says like what the money is for. And they would write in Lithuanian, if only the publication of this book helps to deal the deep wound in, of yeah. our nation. Mm -hmm. So it was very heart felt. So I mean, I was like, oh, I never said, give me money ever, you know? And, and like, so then because, you know, we collected a fair amount of money, we were able to hire a really good book designer and she did a fabulous job. We were able to do like, this is like good quality, really top of the line um, paper. And actually, you know, when the, the book in the Lithuanian language came out like 2019, well, two, yeah, actually 2000, February, 2020. But by the time this book was coming out, it was already COVID and Lithuania was hit hard. So we also, you know, it was an issue getting paper you know, getting papers and a lot of the um, printing presses were closing down because so many employees had COVID-19 and couldn't work mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it's really like a lot of people, I mean, people live in apartment buildings close together, so it really spread. So it was like, we were like, you know, white knuckle experience. Are we going to get our book into, is there going to be a publishing house that will be able to physically even print the book? But it all, it all worked out. And really, so, I mean, the book is, the two books are funded by people's um, donations. Like a lot of old friends of mine started donating. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it was really, it just like there was a lot of uh, goodwill. And what has been interesting is I feel as if Matilda, like I don't feel that anybody can claim authorship of this book. I think it's really is Matilda's book. And that's why it's her name. I have, book, I have one know? last question. And yeah. It has to do because this is obviously a history thing. I'm trying, you know, Lithu Lithuania was one of these countries. We have the Germans and we have the Russians. Right. So I'm, um, um, if you know that history, because I'm trying yeah. to figure, you know, figure this out. Right. Uh, because I'm assuming that they're doing, going through the same thing as the other, you know, other countries at that time. Are mm -hmm. you so? So what was the political, the politics? during the time of Matilda in terms of the Germans and the Russians, or is that something that comes up later on? No, no, what was, what happened in Lithuania was, you know, Lithuania declared independence in 1918. Okay. But they actually really became independent in 1920 because they had to fight the Soviet Union. It was a war of independence. Yes. Um, and so they, you know, they set up their independent government. Actually, my grandfather was a diplomat um, for the Lithuanian independent government who sent to New York in 1936 with my grandmother, serve as a diplomat. The war started in 1939. They weren't able to come back. So he was a diplomat in exile. So that's how my family, um, you know, we come from New York. But so what happened was that when the Soviet, the Soviet Union, um, it, they, it was, you know, they were, gave Lithuania an ultimatum that they wanted to bring in, now I can't remember the exact number of troops, but I think like 50,000 troops, I can't remember the exact number, but they wanted to bring in the troops and Lithuania had to make a decision. They could take the choice that Finland took, which was to fight and resist at that time, or to allow the troops to be stationed. And, you know, we read the history, there's all these debates about, you know, which way to go, but basically the government um, saw at that time, Finland had not yet won their war, they, they felt that there would be a lot of bloodshed, a lot of loss of life. 
if they um, fought because it's just tiny country, no support, you know, population 3 million against the Soviet Union. Um, and they also felt because they had been part of Tsarist Russia, um, the Russian language is like the lingua franca of the region. They thought, well, somehow we can manage to get along with them and, and, and cope with this. And they did not expect it to be a murderous, bloody takeover, but it was. Um, what happened was that there was a, a fake election, like a forced election was, was you know, held to like allegedly Lithuania chose to be part of the Soviet Union. Then um, they, uh, the, the Soviet government, they rounded up um, in 1941, in June of 1941, they rounded up um, government officials, anybody in government, school teachers, school teachers were considered enemies of the state professors, um, the, you know, um, the intellectual class, and actually 30% um, of, they, de they deported them to Siberia, 30% of that uh, deportation were also um, Jewish Lithuanians because they were bourgeois, they were considered part of the, the ones who owned factories, um, had roles in government, that, that level of society. So they were sent beyond the Arctic Circle and they died in brutal conditions, they were, they were deported. So really, in 1941, the summer of 1941, you have a country that has no government because either they, they, they fled or they were murdered, or they were executed, or they were sent to Siberia. So you have a government, you have no government. You have, not, you know, you have these attempts at setting up governments. Um, and then the Nazis, well, the, the break the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, and they occupy Lithuania and then it becomes, they are, um, become the, the governing forces. And so you had a lot of chaos at this time. And this is what Matilda and her family got caught up in. Um, this like two occupations happening at the same time. So her diary is written during that year of the Soviet occupation, 1940, 1941. And you see that she's trying to She's really passionate about her studies, mm -hmm. about her poetry. She's trying, she's in love. She's um, like any young person trying to live a life. And then you have this, this, this um, political situation that's, that's um, and the war that's bearing down on them. So it was a, it was a complex time. Yeah. I have, I have two questions. The first one is in, in your reading tonight, yeah. you uh, sort of set up uh, Matilda's use of the reference to wanting to have a baby yeah. or the loss of a baby to be related to uh, the, the Jewish population that was yeah. suffering. Yeah. And, and that recurred. And, and I was sort of listening for that because of how you set it up. But every time I heard her refer to this, yeah. this baby issue until the very end when she was saying, I want the baby to give all my love to yeah. to someone, um, I kept thinking about a miscarriage. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering where, because I didn't hear anything in the poetry, where did you find that the baby was a reference for the Do Jews? You know, you know, I had to really, really dig deep um, to with her, her diary and her poetry because I realized that you know, I didn't realize, but I thought like, okay, when, if, if her work gets translated into other languages, very likely they will work with the English translation. So I can't get anything wrong. And so um, in terms of her poetry with the reference to um, the baby, the Jewish lullaby, she always kind of like, the way she works with her poetry is that on, on one level, it might seem very simple and straightforward, but there's all these layers underneath. And so um, she, on one level, she's literally thinking about, you know, a baby being a mother, um, you know, she was a young woman and that was in a traditional society where, you know, they married young and had families. But she also, when you read it in Lithuanian, it's very clear these references that she's making um, between, you know, this sense of this, this fragile child baby and, and the Jewish nation, it's, it, it's, in the, it's, it's in the Lithuanian language. But I actually, with her diary, one thing that I was really, um, was try, didn't want to get wrong because she is, you know, she's in love with this young man and there are some parts of the diary that are sexual. 
And I, um, at that time, it was much more conservative time. So it's not like college students now where they're much freer. There were a lot of um, taboos about sexuality before marriage. And so I was, there are some references though that make it seem that she had broken through those taboos because at one point she writes about, I'm only 17, but I'm already a woman. <laughs> and I'm, and, and isn't it, and I, some parts of me are just like, uh, uh, a, a, a child, I have pimples on my face, I'm, I'm so childish, and yet now I am a woman. And, you know, and she writes about this, you know, the passion that for this young man who she's madly in love with, who keeps rejecting her and coming back and rejecting her. And I actually, when I drilled it down to like a few sentences, you know, like I, I, I grew up with like household Lithuanian, but then I learned, you know, literary Lithuanian later, you know, as a university student, as a high school student. So I went back to um, friends of mine who are Lithuanian language specialists in Lithuania. And I said, read this sentence and tell me very clearly, you know, what, you know, is she, you know, is she alluding to, you know, a sexual relationship here or is she using a metaphor I really want to know because um, it is um, I do think that it's 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 just that one little piece it's so important because of the cultural taboos I mean Lithuania is a conservative country so it would have been unusual for her to prior to being married especially coming from a very conservative Jewish family to have had, you know, a physical relationship, but it appears that she did. But I don't think, I don't think that that, that miscarriage is part of that. I think, yeah, I think, and I think like like this young man ends up leaving her. He and so and and there's one part of her diary where it's really getting close to the German invasion, and she begs him, like pretty much on hands and knees, begs him to. Um, she doesn't come out and say to marry her, but to not abandon her, not to leave her. In other words, that he has to make that offer and he abandons her. So there's a lot of, um, it's really kind of tragic. It's tragic to read it because there's a lot of, of the sense of woe and sadness. And, and um, but you really have to be very careful with it because like I said, you know, it's how you, um, you know, she never, she's only one place in the diary where she mentions his name everywhere she refers to him as him but in one place she slips up and she says his name and it's a Lithuanian name it's Arunas um, also the name of my ex-husband <laughs> 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 yeah, I know. I lost her connection. I'm personally a very late summer, not expert at all, but a very late summer of uh, the fact that there were Nazi collaborators and that there are now, you know cultural things to be resolved in yeah. Lithuania between their their view of themselves through the war and the reality. And, and I got the impression from your readings tonight that um, there was very much an acknowledgement or realization at the time that there were Nazi collaborators and this was widely known. And yet, um, you know, it, it was news to me, not, you know, just as a lay person. Did, who tries you, to be, you know, fairly in tune with uh, yeah. with world geopolitical issues. So I'm just wondering how how you see this book fitting in to that oh, current that's issue. A question. So are you Lithuanian background? Or? Um, I was adopted by a Lithuanian family. I'm mm -hmm. biologically German heritage, oh, okay. uh, mm -hmm. but um, yes, Carol and I stay with Carol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's I because I grew up when I grew up in the Lithuanian immigrant community. They never, I mean, they never mm -hmm. talked about the German occupation or the Nazis. It was like, um, you know, like the history jumped from 1941 to 1944. But my, my great aunt, I, she took me aside once and told me this story about how during the German occupation, um, she was a dancer and she was um, in this dance troupe and she was living in a dorm. 
And she had her a, a friend who was also a dancer in the group who was Jewish and she hid her under her bed and would sneak food to her and then got this priest to take her over the border to Russia. And she talked about how traumatizing that was, but she would never told her daughter this story. Mm-hmm. And um, so there, but that was, and then my grandparents, because um, they worked with war refugees and they had a close friend who had survived the Holocaust, who was German Jewish. And so I'd heard through my family about um, the, you know, the, what happened to the Jews in Lithuania, but I never heard it in any Lithuanian American organization, such as like Lithuanian school or, or in any of the history books or any, it was as if it never happened. And so for me personally, it was, as I started doing more research and learning more about it, and it was such a shock to me because I hadn't heard about it um, in Lithuania because for 50 years they were occupied. They couldn't talk about any of of this because of the occupation. It was all completely silenced. And so they also didn't know really exactly what had happened because, and if there were, you know, any sites where Lithuanian, where there were Lithuanian Jews have been, you know, massive burial sites, they were marked during the Soviet era as um, Soviet citizens. They were not because it went against the ideology to identify them as Jews. So this history was so blacked out you know, and so maybe you might hear something from your family, but you didn't hear a lot. But as I've been, you know, really working with um, oral histories, like my book, Journey into the Backwaters of the Heart, it's like at that time, a lot of um, witnesses and people who had lived through that history were still alive because I was collecting those stories in 2007, 2008, when people were still alive. And that was when I started learning more and more from the stories about, um, about what actually happened in Lithuania. And really, in the end, for me, the best source is Timothy Snyder's Bound Black Earth. Because, you know, but you know what what Snyder writes about in his book, you know, and some of it's really difficult to read, but this is exactly what I was hearing from survivors, whether they were Jewish Lithuanian or Christian Lithuanian. I mean, it all kind of came together because I, I, you know, it's like you you can look through archives, you can read the history, but also I think it's really important to hear the stories of survivors mm-hmm. when you sit down with them and they mm-hmm. tell you their story. And I did a lot of that in Lithuania when that generation was still alive. I really recorded a lot of stories, spent a lot of time recording stories. And so I think, and now at this point, um, there's a lot of Holocaust education in Lithuania in the schools a lot of programs. And so at this point, you know, you really have to be, you know, living under a rock not to know that. Um, it's, it's really, you know, because I think that because it was a history that was so silenced by, by you know, because like in the West, after World War II, Western Europe was liberated and people could start talking about and examining the history and what happened. Right, but Eastern Europe couldn't talk about anything. Everything was buried. Everything was hidden. Mm-hmm. So that whole process came 50 years later, and it's taken time. Like in the early years of independence, it wasn't really. Also, you know, it took some time, and it took time for people to um, accept it. So, um, so I guess if I if my tone is like, oh, this is common knowledge, that's because I I've been living in Lithuania most of the. You know, I've been in, I haven't left Lithuania for two years because of, the, because of Corona. You know, I wasn't able to leave until I got my vaccines, you know. And um, how long so, ago did you leave? Like a week ago. Oh, really? Oh, my yeah. gosh. Okay, so very clear. Can I ask? Somebody here wanted to ask. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, listen. Okay, great. I did ask you. <laughs> so you you mentioned uh, I can't remember the specific thing at the point that you referred to what the Lithuanians in the Jews. So I was curious in uh, politically, yeah. were there times uh, during which it was like that? Where well, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. But you know, actually, I'm always very careful to say. Christian Lithuanians, Jewish Lithuanians, Litvaks, 
um, because really they're all Lithuanians, right? They just have different religions. Uh, There's been yes. lots of pagan Lithuanians. By what was the, way. the third category you, know. you just said? Litvak is, 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 is the term for Jewish Lithuanian. It's a that so nationality. There's pagan, many pagan Lithuanians, right? So I don't, I don't separate, and that's really important because in the past there was that separation where, you know, I was wondering if you were referring to that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm. I. I. There. I mean, you know, it's it's there's so much more healing work that needs to be done. And I don't think that it's productive to to um, separate. But there are like some of the Lithuanian historians in there. They write about they, you know, they present a picture that you had, um, you know, Lithuanian Jews were the trades when they were the merchants. They lived in town, and the Lithuanian ethnic Lithuanians were farmers, and they met on Saturdays in the market ground or, you know, weekends and traded and bartered and and sold. And otherwise they never met. But really when I interview people, when I dig deeply, when I read um, what has been left behind, I see that actually there was much more mingling and intermarriage and yeah, mixing than my family were worked in uh, yeah. yeah. They were not merchants. Right. But this is it's like this historical, there, there's some. Um, Aiden is one of the historians who, who, there are some Lithuanian historians who come up with this theory, like oh, there were two, two separate worlds and they never met except to sell things to each other. But I don't, my personal opinion is I don't think so that's true because it, it like, it, it, it history yeah. is. Yeah. I wonder if we have any questions from the people on Zoom, but I wonder if they'd like to introduce themselves. Oh, sure. Did you like, uh, <laughs> suddenly Did everyone hear it on Zoom? Yes, yes. Um, so I, I'm really excited about this because my uh, my father's family all emigrated uh, from uh, Lithuania. Yes, Tamara. Yeah. Can you introduce uh, yourself? Yeah. This, Hi, this is Tamara. Hello. <laughs> Tamara oh, Rothman. I see. Now I see you, tiny little. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Let me put yeah. Yeah. So, uh, my father's grandfather uh, was a group of uh, part of a group of eighteen Lithuanian Jewish families that that immigrated from emigrated from Lithuania and landed in Vermont in Burlington. And they they built the first uh, Jewish synagogue in Burlington. Um, so anyway, I, I'm I, I'm very excited about this and about the literature, and I'm really uh, excited about the fact that you first discovered this at a theater in Lithuania. Uh, my background's in theater. Uh, has has anybody attempted to perform? that piece in English? You know, isn't that interesting? I'm so glad you brought that up because that theater program, it was, um, I think she performed it 25 times and some of the actors were children, obviously, and they've since grown up, you know? So, so there came a point where she stopped, um, but she asked me to translate her play into um, English, which I did. And we made it available through Amazon because educators, you know, want to could use it in the classroom, you know. So if you, you know, if you just Google, it's called the Silent the Silence Muse, and so um, and it would be under the name Neringa Daniena D A N I E N E is the playwright. Um, but you could find it on Amazon um, because we did have that. Can you spell that again? D A N I E N E. And the thought was that it would be really wonderful to have it performed in English, but nobody's maybe, maybe somebody can type that in the comments. The connection is oh, yeah. cutting out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, because um, it would be really wonderful if somebody could perform the play in English. I would love it. Great. Oh, there you go. You have a there you go. There you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Internet. I am here. People came around long enough to tell us they were going to do that. They just left, you know, with a different direction. 
So I want people to stay locked up into to ask them to Zoom. And who else is on Zoom right now? Oh, and also, by the way, I left some of my business cards here. So you can, it has the address on my website. It has oh, my wonderful. email address if you wanted to get in touch. Yeah. Linda, Lucky, Lucky. Huh? and Maja. Oh, Maya from Maya. Latvia, who said I want to be on because you're connected by a border. Right? Yeah, as yes. our sister country with yeah, similar languages. Yeah, in a text tonight when I, you know, <laughs> brought in the Zooming people. Yeah. Well, I would like to know who yeah, who you are. are. Yeah, tell me. Huh? We can we can okay. pass the microphone. Yeah. Can we begin here? I think they have loud voices. They're all writers. Yeah. I'd love some more. Kathleen, Kathleen will do that. Kathleen will do that. So nice. Introduction. I have a special guest last week. I said, "Thank you, Ariane, from Poland." Yes. Hello, Maya. Here and Sam. Hello, Maya. My name is Barbara Nijo. I came from Poland in 1979. Mm -hmm. so I was born in Vancouver, and so we went to the same hometown. Uh, my husband stands in the same town. Uh, we went to the same high school. And, uh, <laughs> we graduated from different universities. Okay. <laughs> 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 we have uh, 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 some years for more than some So, I'm um, the of the American They have been in existence for 40 years. So, uh, it's very interesting uh, to meet you and uh, hear about the country that Poland was always so in the past, which we are so close to. Yes, um, and uh, we have a wonderful poet, Adam Mitskiewicz, that he played oh, yes. as we all like that we <laughs> <don't know. laughs> He was a, a, a Polish man who wrote in Polish, yeah. but he was born in the early 20s. Also, uh, Adam Skowielo. There's a very close history between yes. Poland and Lithuania. I am the rest of the family, and, and I have some uh, relatives from Vilnius area, and Vilnius is the same as uh, my mother's, I uh, uh, was also sent to Siberia because she was from the uh, now Ukraine, and, uh, both in the Stratford area. But uh, uh, you mentioned in your um, reading that there were some uh, indication that uh, Jewish people were only in the small villages or small towns, and they are merchants. Actually, Vilnius was the, um, the history is different, but it was a, a cultural uh, yes, center. Yes, it was. Yeah. And, and there were. Uh, All of that is in the book. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah. and, and the 30s, uh, yeah. uh, Czesław Miłosz uh, reclaimed that he's Polish, he yeah. might be Jewish or <laughs> might be Lithuanian. <laughs> but uh, in Vilna itself, uh, there were about 50%, 51%, maybe 52% Poles, but there were also about 40% Jewish people. Yes. They were yes. Jerusalem of Polish Jewish. speakers and, yeah. and also, um, not Hebrew, but uh, Yiddish uh, speakers, but they were intellectuals, they were professors of the universities, mm -hmm. uh, they were doctors, lawyers. So they were not only merchants, and, and the lady said that her uh, family was not uh, merchants mm -hmm. because. Uh, in, in Lvov, the same. I mean, there were a lot of uh, Jewish people who were professor of the university, lawyers, attorneys, and well, so. I have a, uh, my other side came from um, yeah. 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 All right. And, and they so. were uh, tailors. Mm -hmm. so that's their... And there were some, uh, you know, history is really uh, now, now since we can really read what that, what was. Uh, then, like you mentioned, in, in Poland, we were free country since 1945, but actually until 1989, uh, there were more Russian troops in Poland than there were Polish troops in, in, in Poland. So it was, a, it was a different story. But uh, it's, it's now we are learning that uh, 
especially about Polish and Jewish and Lithuanian and Jewish relationship. Uh, not very many people realize, but in, prior to 1939, there were more Jewish people in Poland than the entire world combined. So there was, and they didn't come to Poland because they were prosecuted. You know, if, if King of Poland, Kazimierz Wielki, or Kazimierz was the, the great, his, uh, he could have children with a Jewish uh, beautiful lady. So if the Jewish uh, people living in Poland, were, uh, ladies were good for a king, they apparently they were good for something more than, than just uh, merchants. Right? So, you know, there was, uh, it's difficult now to talk about this, but I think we come to the point, and you mentioned hard history about uh, uh, Lithuanian, Latvians, and uh, Estonian collaboration with the uh, German. Poland is actually could be proud that they were the only country that were occupied by Germany. They Germany didn't force Poles to form it like SS uh, Georgia. Lithuania did not have SS. Yeah. Lithuania did not, didn't have They that. did not. Latvia did not. These oh. really, these were really just like, kind of like, this low level of society, there were opportunities you know, for, a bon for a bottle of vodka, for you know, like the stealing a gold watch. This it, was the type of people who, who um, joined the. You remember that uh, perhaps uh, it was uh, President uh, Clinton was uh, president and chief of staff of uh, U.S. Air Force was General Charlie Kashvili, who was born in Warsaw, actually. But do you remember when people uh, accused him and he said, your father was uh, actually a general in German SS Georgia. Yeah. And they said, and what I could do as a child. I mean, this is such a beautiful country that we love so much because you are yourself. What your parents are, it's, you didn't have really nothing to say. And General Shaligashvili actually became the first not born American who was chief of staff of the United States. This is unbelievable. It couldn't happen anywhere. It's just unbelievable. So, so you know, we are getting, uh, and that's why we are in this country. We are proud, you know, no matter where you come, you are proud of American, and, and we feel this here. Like to add something to what you said, Stan, about Vilnius and the Jewish population. And the Jewish quarter in Vilnius was actually within the city walls. It was a part of the city, and it was known as the Jerusalem of the North. Yes. And filled with scholars and all kinds of you know, yeah. And in Kaunas, a third of Kaunas was Jewish. Yes. And it was not a quarter. It yeah. was just a part of life. The Jewish hospital was in the center of town. So the war changed everything. Um, because before the war, the two Jewish Lithuanians and Lithuan Christian Lithuanians now they, they lived together and they interacted and then the war came yeah. and everything changed. You know, when you it's it's so interesting because like it when you when you have a book that, you know, and we, we put this book out in the Lithuanian language in Lithuania, it's kind of like everybody knows that Lithuania was the Jerusalem of the North, so we didn't feel that we had to put that information in. But now I'm realizing no. that oh. in the English language, we should. Sure. There should be, yes. there, we should, that should be explained. Oh. That just, it just hit me that mm -hmm. um, it's hard to make, when you, when you have that you're transitioning to a different, country that sometimes things that might not be, need to be explained. That, that's something, at least a footnote. And we got to remember something that we said we were going, what was this with a national discipline? But I wonder if we could actually get around this room. I mean, I don't think everyone has a story, everyone has to share. Um, so let's, but let's try, because uh, I think I now I'm holding people here until they get a chance to say what they want to do. But Peter is, a, is next uh, on my I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm the playwright. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed mm -hmm. what you did. You did a terrific job curating mm -hmm. all that material. Um, we, we read some of it. We found some of it before we got here. Yeah. And so I recognized it. And I thought the way you kind of put it all together. Uh, oh, and I'm, I'm basically just a, a, a student of the Holocaust and of that period of the war. 
and I found it very interesting. I had no idea who the person was. I've never heard of her before. So, thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, Matilda was completely, completely, completely unknown. And, and this is a whole idea. And it's just been amazing how many, I mean, people do art projects about her now. You know, people write, write their own poems, oh, read some of her poems. You see it just, you know, the interest is just growing. Oh, so I'm Kathleen Tarr, and I, my great grandparents are from Lithuania, and I, I actually got to visit Lithuania two years ago, and so I'd like to go back. And I'm just curious, um, how many people here? Raise your hand. Have some Lithuanian ancestry. How many people in here? So quite a few. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I also agree with Peter. There was a fantastic job you did. How you wrote in her poetry with her biography. What you've discovered, your research, and it's, it sounds it's a fantastic thing that you've done to bring this to the world. Really great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just blown away by it. I want, I want to read the book now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I'm so glad to get introduced to this young woman. And. Uh, I, I'm here with Peter, and I'm, I'm just a happy tag along here. And I'm so <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> and her website, by the way, is fabulous, you guys. So take a look at her website. Lima's website is wonderful. Half of it is in Lithuanian, and the other half is in English. You know, if you click a Lithuanian flag, you get Lithuanian. You click the American flag, you get the Wow. Yeah, that's, that's like one of the big challenges was like there's so much material and, you know, interpret, interpreting really the poem, job. presenting the poem, presenting the manuscript. So, thank How you. about over here? We don't know. So, uh, David Carolaris here, um, a German uh, biology from the uh, Johann Sebastian Bach family, but adopted at birth by, by a Lithuanian family that was probably uh, third generation, not, not a lot of family history. In fact, um, I, in a, in a, in a non-educated uh, uh, crowd, I might uh, use a term that I remember from childhood, but now I'm afraid because I don't know if it's Lithuanian or Russian oh, or ahead. Polish. You, 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 so, um, I was raised thinking a lot of things that we said as a kid were, that my parents said were Lithuanian phrases that turns out they were Polish phrases, you know. And so there was a lot of, in my adoptive family, a lot of um, Polish and Lithuanian background. But, um, and so I used to live, we, my wife Pam and I used to live across the street from Spaya. And oh. now I have an expert to just send a little uh, photo to. <laughs> is, this, is this historical family document in Polish or Lithuanian? It's fine. Right. And then we decided what to do with it from there. But this was fascinating to me. Um, we're big fans of uh, Henry Louis Gates' uh, Finding Your Roots oh, right. and, and also a fan of choosing your roots mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in the sense that, you know, we, we, um, we grow up thinking we know who we are, um, and then we learn other things that may or may not change our perspective of ourselves, right? And so it's fascinating to me uh, to have both an adoptive and a biological family that I've since found, and then also this cultural connection to Lithuania and also to Germany, and just, you know, I, I, I'm not sure uh, where to stand some days, but it's all fascinating yeah. to me. So, you you know, you. it's it's interesting because, like I told you, like when I, when I'm, I love to sing Lithuanian folk songs, and there's this one folk group that I would just oh, we hang out and together and you sing. And there's a woman, she probably in her seventies, and to me, she looks like you know, um, like a Jewish woman from New York. You know, she's got just the build, the look, and everything. But she's an expert in Lithuanian folk songs. And one day. She tells the group, she's like, I just found out that I am actually Jewish and that as an infant, I was given to a Lithuanian family um, um, during the Holocaust for safekeeping. Um, wow. I mean, she must be older than her 70s. But mm -hmm. I always looked at her and I could, you know, just see, like, she always looked like a little Jewish lady that happened to me. But she was like, you know, singing songs in dialect and it was like this big thing for her that she's like she's like now I have to learn about my real heritage but it was revealed to her in you know really really in, you know in her old age and so talk about 
having your identity completely changed on you. Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah, those stories about the Jewish babies are so interesting. In other countries too, my son is doing a documentary story initiated by a man who was a baby saved, yeah. but in Amsterdam in Holland. Identity is such a fascinating thing because we, it's like you said, we think, you think you know your identity and then all of a sudden you have a different one, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, here, let me jump in <laughs> since you skipped me. officer and a Polish woman who ran away to get there, you know, to, you know, that's how she got to um, uh, China, was, was, you know, running away at the time of the revolution, uh, roughly. You know, I, when I lived in China, I know of a writer who did research on this, Paul Bunch. So, <laughs> well, she didn't even speak Polish, yeah. and the country didn't have, it was the time that in Poland wasn't named as a country, but that right? I, mean, I, I hear this only from my, I, won't, you know, I, I only know this from family history. Um, but the other piece that is interesting is a nephew who was left behind, uh, you know, who grew up in, in Poland under, under the Soviets, jumped ship, got away to Canada, and um, became an architect and, and, and lives there even now, Mazakowski. Um, and but when he was looking for his <laughs> aunt, the one who had gone to Shanghai, China to meet the American, you know, yeah. that happened, he said um, <laughs> they had found that this aunt was in Port Angeles. Washington, right? Washington, right? Right? And he said, no, you stupids. It is not Port Angeles. It's Los Angeles. It is not Port Angeles. The right name is Los Angeles, which caused him to be, you know, messed up and confused for several more years. Port Angeles. She was very suspicious when she got the call from him. She made him name the name of of dogs and cats the family had. A lot of Europeans trying to get to America by pretending to be relatives. You can say that my story. I didn't want to take too much. Paul French's work because he's researched this that um, Russians and Poles, this is like, you know, during the Bolshevik Revolution, they just sought refuge in Shanghai. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah it's I mean, I actually saw a whole presentation he did about this with photographs and documents and everything. They ran nightclubs. You'll have to tell me again the guy's name. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll write it down. But I think it's like a lot of, a lot of <laughs> people grew up with ballet lessons and voice lessons. So when they got to Shanghai to make a living, they, they had cabarets, they had nightclubs. Oh. And they would get up and do like some dances on stage and shampoo, sure, you know. Yeah. And Shanghai has no requirement for passports. That's why oh, it's oh, 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 was actually true. born on the 4th of July in Shanghai, China. Have any of you heard about the Lithuanian consulate officer of Japan, Sumitaro? He allowed for many, oh. many people to oh, yes, come from the Holocaust mm-hmm. region to pass mm-hmm. all the way through Russia to Shanghai. Mm-hmm. It's a fascinating mm-hmm. 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 yes. And we've had several visitors at the museum that are descended from Shanghai Ghetto Jews and Jews. Yeah. 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 His son came to the Matilda Bush event in Vegas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yes. Thanks, I guess. All right. Yeah, I, I'm with him. My parents actually met in London. Was a, in the British Women's Army. And, um, I never, they never talked anything about about 
the war, and I actually recognized some of the things that you'd said, mm -hmm. but um, meeting him and then more, more significantly for this conversation, meeting his cousin who was um, a Catholic nun who joined the convent and, and she was like 19 or something. And um, her whole job was teaching English to Lithuanian girls. Immigrant girls. And, immigrant girls. In England. And she did that for decades and then, then that stopped being necessary. So then she taught um, English to Vietnam, um, yeah. young girls from Vietnam. What, what state? In, in uh, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania. Yeah. And oh, right. um, and she just passed away. This yeah, year. she just passed away. We, had, um, we, we got a lot of historical um, items from her, which we've asked for most of them on to Saya for her museum. But um, this was really interesting to me from multiple perspectives. And uh, I totally agree. It was great how you combined the biography her personal story with her poetry, which was incredibly moving. I wonder if it was in tears. <laughs> I want to add, I haven't seen Pam for about seven years, something like that. She's associated with the Alaska Children's Alliance. Um, are you, what's your role with them? Well, I'm now retired. Retired, now allegedly. Big, um, big deal, <laughs> a big deal program, protecting children from sexual abuse. Right. Okay, I'm Susan Yacona, and I am of Lithuanian descent, originally from the Chicago area, but been in Alaska for 32 years. Somewhere along the line, I met Svaya. I can't even remember when or where, but um, she was a great find. <laughs> um, so my grandparents were born uh, right after their parents came over. In fact, one of my great aunts was born on the boat coming over. So um, one of my grandmas, her uh, two siblings were born in Lithuania. One sister was born on the, in the on boat coming over. Then my grandma was born. <laughs> then her mother died in childbirth shortly after. And so they were all part of a very close um, Lithuanian community in Chicago and spoke Lithuanian, um, lived it very culturally. Uh, it was, it's been very interesting. I've had the Balzakis Museum doing some genealogy research for me. Mm -hmm. And so getting some census records have been interesting because uh, that grandma that I was talking about, we were very close. And um, her name was Mildred and she always hated that name. And she, went by other names sometimes mm -hmm. for fun and you know just first names and going through the census records her name was actually Amelia and somewhere along the line I think because she was called Millie and Amelia can sound kind of like that mm -hmm. that it got written you know just differently yeah. um, in records so there's just a lot of history there about what happened with these people over the years um, and speaking of the Balzekis Museum, I've been doing, with the pandemic, I saw the availability of Zoom classes to learn the language. And I, I've, I did some like Pinsler classes and stuff like that. And I had some things I picked up from family. And you, you pick up the feel of it and the language and the foods and all of those things. But um, I never learned it officially. I'd try to read it in different ways, but it would take me forever. And um, so I started doing these Zoom Lithuanian classes. And mm -hmm. our time, I have That's to great. do them at 6 a.m. on Saturday. I have to be on Zoom. Mm -hmm. it's it's Lithuanian. Oh, yeah. But I have this great group of people now. We've done three eight-week courses together. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Who's your teacher, by the way? Because I have it's a friend who does this in Lithuania. What is your yes, teacher? What's it? What is Cutting, it? Cutting Lake? She's, yeah. she's, she works for the Balzacus Museum. Oh, okay, all right. Sure. And she's also works for University of Illinois yeah. and teaches Lithuanian. Um, and she's from there. Yeah. And uh, so it's, I mean, she gives us hard homework and we have to turn it around and get it corrected and sent back before the next Saturday and we're on the spot. And, you know, it's just, it's great though because it's been very challenging. And I've have you been met people, I have met. 
Um, well, I, I went to Lithuania, yeah. Um, do they ever talk about the links of Lithuanian and Sanskrit language? A little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. But speaking of Pennsylvania, I just have to mention there's a lady in uh, my little group now. We're just we're we're all connected now. We have some social hours and you know during the breaks in between our classes and stuff. And um, one of the women is an attorney in Pennsylvania, and she worked very hard for many years getting settlements for minors with black lung disease. Mm -hmm. Just really cool lady. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Interesting. Right. My, my adoptive mom's uh, father had black lung. Yeah. yeah. Because the first mm -hmm. wave of the so yeah. 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 Well, so in Illinois too, a lot of them, I mean, they had to go do what they had to do to make money. So. That's my story. Mm -hmm. Leslie, so, Leslie, thank you. That was, that was really great. That was great. I really enjoyed, enjoyed your presentation, and I definitely want that book. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, uh, I wish I, wish I could speak with Wendy and um, I, I've only more recently discovered some of the roots of my family. I think uh, after the Holocaust, I suppose we were one of those Jewish families that chose not to talk about it, really. And so, um, ironically, I'm working as the head of this Jewish museum here, and I, this is like, wow. And so I've learned an amazing amount of information about my family now, and somebody in my family started this little website, genie.com kind of site, mm -hmm. and the family now, I only do as far back as my grandmother on the Lithuanian side yeah. in Brooklyn. Yeah. And now this site goes back to 1640. Yeah. It's in, in the Lithuania area. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's unbelievable. And and so uh, the, the story that I know the most about really is my great grandfather, who um, so I, my grandfather's father, um, who uh, joined the, um, the movement to find a Jewish state somewhere, but this is at the beginning of the 1900s. Yeah. So he went to, a, there was a center for, for that in Manchester, England. He joined with those people. And, you know, there was the 1903 convention to propose having a Jewish state in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and he was, a, he was opposed to that. So, um, so I found I found out all of this stuff more recently, and uh, it's pretty darn interesting. But in, as far as Lithuania, it seems like um, family kind of came out of the Kovna area, mm. the Kalis yeah. area. And, what was their serving? Um, I cannot remember. I I just looked at it this morning yeah. to prepare, and I I blanked it out. Uh, but it, somebody told me it was a name invented for Jews at that time. It's not a very flattering surname that was attributed to, I don't know if that's true. I don't really know if that's true. Yeah. But um, they, the town was really jumping. Really but you know what, like in Lithuania, a lot of people are really- into Oh, Yankulik, not Yankulik. Um, it's nothing offensive about that. I don't know where I heard that, that some, somehow it was a, a surname given as a negative. You know, in Lithuania, like a lot of Lithuanian people, because of the interruption of the Soviet years, it's really popular to do genealogy and, and research your surnames. And they have this, um, it's a government website, I could write down the name for you, oh, and you plug in surnames, and you know, oh, they find, like, you know, birth records, you know, I, I actually been, me I've been meaning to do that myself for my own family, and now I'm going to find this summer, and I'll, yeah. you know, dig into it, but there, okay, there's also a family story, mythology kind of thing, yeah. where yeah. everyone went, most everyone went to New York, and then there were a couple of the brothers who just sort of backpacked it to Palestine and started the whole wing of the family there. 
So that was, I don't, you know, I can't imagine backpacking the towns of the community, but they did. Um, okay, I know, I don't. I don't <laughs> like that. I would love to get that. I'll write it out for you, but there's, there's a website. And I just, you know, I myself have been meaning to go on and plug in some family surnames myself. Actually, it's one friend of mine, her husband, just goes on and on and on talking about his website. Wow. <laughs> you know, I know about it. Right. They're trying to computerize everything, like it's baptismal records, yeah. birth records, Whoa. you know, whatever documentation exists. Champagne is not, you know, surnames and birthdays, they're uploading it into this website so that you can plug in your family name. Thank you, I definitely want to. Who would like to go next? We're um, actually, we're going to run down here. Yeah, that's right. Let's go. Let's run down here because it's filming because I keep going like this. So. That would be very helpful for me. I'm sorry, but you're next. <laughs> My background's going to take you to an entirely different world. <laughs> My background is, um, um, <laughs> well, it's Spanish and French. My father was born in Saskatchewan, so he was... French Canadian, but he was also Blackfoot and Sioux India. My mother's family, they're direct descendants of the French aristocrats that came to the New World uh, because Napoleon III, the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, wanted to get rid of the Holy Roman Emperor, who was Maximilian. And so my family was in the court of Maximilian. And they were musicians and writers <laughs> and poets. <laughs> All so of that stuff. <laughs> so in my family, music, yeah. I am a pianist and a singer. My daughter is an actress and a singer who married a, <laughs> a conductor. My grandfather uh, was, uh, as, as I say, a, con a conductor and a um, uh, concert pianist mm -hmm. who traveled uh, in South America with Sarah Bernhardt in the 1800s. So mm -hmm. I am all over the place, but it's an entirely different, <laughs> different world. But, but the music and the arts have gone from every single generation. And so my, my daughter uh, was, a, was a theater designer and also a, an actress with Molly Smith at Perseverance Theater. And so, and she also was in, uh, when Molly and um, her partner went to Washington, D.C. Yeah, Molly, that. pardon? I don't remember, remember that. that. I'm not okay. in because Molly is the director of the Arena Stage, which is the biggest repertory theater company in the country. And they are, she and her partner, who is also a Lakota Indian. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, as I say, we're going into a different part of the world here than you guys. Most of you are into the Slavic and the German and whatever. You know, so so uh, I always felt I was more of an American than anybody else because I covered Canada, the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so that's that. Yeah. <laughs> this is like a talking circle. This is like a talking circle. <laughs> but, but, I, but I must tell you, I married a Czechoslovakian. Oh, oh, there you go. Oh, my goodness. I know how to do sex food. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if you can Well, part of the uh, one of the reasons that I started it was because the document, the uh, uh, film, you know, became a, a, a very important uh, sort of communication medium, and uh, people really didn't understand how valuable it was, and also television. And one of the things, again, I think because I have such this history, I've always been sort of fascinated with it. Uh, I was concerned because a lot of things were being thrown away. People didn't really understand that 
uh, moving image and sound materials are as, as, as important or maybe more important mm -hmm. than print materials mm -hmm. because you hear the voices and you see the yes. people yeah. and what have you. But mm -hmm. for whatever reason, that wasn't, you know, and so when I got involved, I went to Los Angeles to, and I can't remember who the directors were, but it was the beginning of uh, an organization called, uh, it was a moving image organization because yeah. they were, they were just beginning to be aware the importance of saving all these materials. Now, uh, Australia, yeah. <laughs> Canada, and other parts of the world were on top of this far before the people in the United States were. And so some, somehow or I stepped into something that was a, a beginning, you know, of really trying to preserve all of these things. And that's a whole other well, you know, oh, like okay. a, a, a Lakota, Lithuanian connection, yeah. I had a student um, yeah. um, from Vilnius University who she was just so interested in Native Americans and Native American literature. She ended up writing a thesis about N. Scott Mamaday's work, oh, um, yes. for, you know, for that mm -hmm. I was a thesis advisor. Then I helped her get a Fulbright, mm -hmm. and she um, earned a PhD in Native American studies, yeah. ended up marrying a Lakota man, and is has been doing this project of um, preserving Lakota oh, yeah. voices. Where oh, what they do is absolutely. they go out to the elders and they yeah. just yeah. record them telling their stories, and they are building this archive. Yeah. So there's a Lithuanian Lakota connection. Well, <laughs> and one of the things I got immediately involved in was what I was most concerned was that the native uh, heritage of Alaska was not being saved. So that's what I threw. So I started mm -hmm. out as a uh, um, building on to the Alaska Festival of Music. So this was the, the native festival of music. Yeah. I got to the point, and so where we had dancers, you know, uh, all the indigenous uh, groups, and we had stories, and we had songs, and we had, you know, in other words, and we attached it to the Alaska Festival of Music for many years that Robert Shaw was the uh, sort of major, for, you know, I mean, this was an incredible band. That's, Started that was very. You guys are such an interesting group. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to be Wow, where did I end up? You know, I you. You. So we were all just talking about this. I mean, Oh, yes, oh, Carol. <laughs> yes, we're going this way. First of all, actually, I'm not. Thank you very much. Tell me where they go. I'm flying into our cottage. <laughs> That's the only word I have. Just remember if you want to sneeze. Yeah. <laughs> and also, I'm very aware of the um, memorial property to Alaska. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for any of you who met out in the Bays and Seward, mm -hmm. you're here with your family this week. And I um, express my condolences. Yes. And I'm, I'm amazed that you have the energy to also join us mm -hmm. this evening for this event. I, I miss the stomach. So thank you very much. And, my heart goes out to you to come to the last yeah. for such a moment. Yesterday, in Resurrection Bay, we released Ray's oh, ashes. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh. And who was this? Uh, my, uh, oh, my aunt. What was his name? Ray Sidrukas. Um, so my my family comes from Lithuania on both sides, my, both my grandparents. And I know that they managed to escape before World War I. My uh, grandfather on my mother's side went back and fought in the war and was gassed, he was gassed in the trenches, came back to America with a very short life afterwards. But I know that um, it's been interesting to delve into what my heritage is all about. And as an adult, I find myself peering deeper and deeper and deeper into what this actually represents. I've had the privilege to travel back to Lithuania several times and meet my living relatives. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, my, my mother, many, many years ago, handed me a picture from Argentina. And she said, promise me, my mother was about to die, but she said, promise mm -hmm. me, you will find yourself in American relations. And it turns out that there was one group of Lithuanians that came to Boston, New York, Chicago, and another group went to South America. So, before the internet was really active and before you could access Facebook and all of that, I, I went upon this quest. How can I find my relations in South America? And it's like um, 
if you think you found, you found somebody, it's much like trying to process a call from like the prince from Nigeria that says, oh, right. <laughs> 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 and you want to prove that you really are related and you want to get the election. So finally, I, I found my relations in business areas, my relations from buildings. And we triangulated. So this is a group of people from before World War I over 100 years ago that went to South America. And, and then um, I had the, the, the lovely opportunity to travel back to the Vilnius that year. And I, I sat down with a group of people on a baptism ceremony. And I said, bring all the elders. Somebody translate for me. I have found our relations. I found them for our family. I know they're our blood. And the outpouring of love and passion was so deep, it was so profound. And so now there's this triangular connection yeah. between <laughs> America, Vilnius, <laughs> South America. That's and very Lithuanian. <laughs> 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 and the woman close to her, I mean, they're all relations mm -hmm. because I understand there's a very extended community. Yeah. I have I have Lithuanian friends from from Argentina, yeah. but I also like both on my mother's and my father's side have relatives in Argentina. Oh, and some of them are on Facebook. And wow. I think like maybe we'll do that quest together. Yeah. I have to do that. <laughs> maybe we'll relate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then um, after I and I was mentioning I I saw the responses and recording Matilda's poems about longing and um, her premonitions and these, yeah. these strong feelings and connections. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I connect with that also. I, I feel there's a sense deep within me that's very powerful. And it, it doesn't seem to be American, whatever the hell that is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there yeah. seems to be this ancient connection. Um, you talked about uh, Matilda's connection with lilies. And um, whether they were trampled or blooming and beautiful. And I know one of my family crests was Lily's. Can you um, she, talk about that? She loved um, Lily's. <laughs> and <laughs> Lily's come up a lot in her culture. And you know, oh, well, here's an interesting, strange detail that when I got married, I insisted that I have a bouquet of calla lilies. Yeah. No other flower, just calla yeah. lilies. Yes. And the white calla lilies. Yes. Oh like, in, like in her poems, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it was just, just yeah. all these like layers of symbols. But, but she, um, and there's a, a sculptor in Panemonianus in her village, a Lithuanian yes. sculptor, mm -hmm. that he created this like sculpture, this it's like this totem um, in honor of her. And he carved the lilies into mm -hmm. it. That's mm -hmm. what I'm yeah. Yeah. That's it was just a favorite mm -hmm. moment. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you yeah. for yeah. Thank, you. thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. We love to hear the triangulation. Monica. Monica. Okay, oh, well, God. where do I start? Oh, <laughs> thank, you. Well, thank you so much. And thanks oh, to yes. everyone. These stories are so they deep are and so rich good. and wonderful. Um, so my mom was born in Sosnowiec, uh, Poland, which is in the Southwest, and she came to the United States when she was five years old, and she says, I learned English with no special programs, <laughs> um, just by going to school every day, you know, and um, she, my grandmother um, had a, a pretty storied life, and she was when she was young, she was forced to work in a camp and for like 16 hours a day, and she almost died. And so I think my mother carried a lot of that sorrow with her because in the 90s, I wanted to go and investigate my Polish family, and she did not want to accompany me. And she said she she was afraid that they might keep her there. That's the way she said it. And I think she probably carried my grandmother's trauma in, in her cells and her bones. And I also feel like she maybe passed it down to me because there's always been sort of a melancholy that I've carried. Yeah. And I think it's from her. Yeah. And um, so we never did make that trip. And, um, and then my father's family, they're Czech. So they came over um, 
to the United States. And my grandfather, actually, um, his name was Mazur. Well, he sort of snuck in with a bunch of Italian guys. Yeah. So he took the name Marzoni. Marzoni. <laughs> oh, my I'm not Italian. And so all my life before I was married, oh, you're Italian. Oh, whatever. <laughs> you know? so, but my, my Czech name is, is Mazur. Oh, so it's just interesting the way, you know, the people come over and, and take on different identities and names and cultures. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, like... Like in Lithuania, you know, most towns and villages, they have a Lithuanian name, a Polish name, a Yiddish name, oh, a Russian oh, name. Oh, and oh, and oh, even oh, like when we were, you know, with the book, you know, with the book, yes. you know, with this book that really, you know, because like it could be Olkin, it could be Olkinas, there's different ways of, it, you know, depending on the language. But actually what we decided, um, was to just stick with the Lithuanian law that said that well, however your name is written in your passport, that's your name. Mm -hmm. And so her her name was, because she was born in independent Lithuania, it was Matilda Olkinaite. It had like that Lithuanian ending mm -hmm. on it. So that's what we, what we stayed with. Because I guess whatever's in your passport is your name. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in my passport, my name is Lima Vince so I, I just need to like Lima Vince, which becomes like Lima Vince. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, um, I've learned so much tonight from Lima <laughs> and from all of you. It's pretty incredible. All my uh, grandparents came from the community around the twentieth century. Um, the most, uh, a lot of them were priests and nuns, and um, one of my um, grandfather's first cousins founded the Lithuanian, or first Lithuanian order of nuns, um, St. Kasmers, and she went back and forth. She also founded an order yeah. in Lithuania. Yeah. Which city? Yeah. Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to respond a little bit to Francine in uh, bringing up the Native American thread because Milan Kundera called Lithuania the reservation of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, the, the place where you know the language was eliminated, the culture yeah. was eliminated, the religion was eliminated, where they tried assimilation, um, where they sent them you know to Siberia or whatever, you know, away from their countries. Um, and when I came to Alaska, my work was with indigenous groups and an attorney with indigenous rights. And um, I felt so comfortable in the villages because it felt, you know, I was used to uh, elders speaking a different language. Mm -hmm. um, I was used to a kind of subsistence lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I did too. I had that comfort because of my father and the yeah. His Indian background, but it wasn't it wasn't a strange yeah. thing for me. Well, I had more than one Athabascan um, ask me if I was Athabascan. Mm -hmm. well, you know what they asked me was what my tribe was. Yeah, oh, was, what is your Indian tribe? Man. And I would say Lithuanian, <laughs> and they would say, "Is that Athabascan?" <laughs> 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 In, you know, in my relations with the indigenous groups here. And I'm not fluent in Lithuanian. Um, you know, I had, I spoke Lithuanian as a child before I went to school. Um, mm -hmm. But I have a seed to build on, and like you, I've been sort of in late years trying to relearn a lot. Um, and I'd already mentioned to Lima that I have learned a lot through translating letters that. Um, uh, relatives in Lithuania sent to my grandparents in Lithuania from 1920 to the 70s. And in that process, I've learned a lot. Um, and I'm kind of in the process of trying to translate some of my poems into Lithuanian, mm -hmm. um, using not Zoom so much, but a uh, 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 young woman in Lithuania through Kutalki. I don't know how many of you know about that. It's a, they match people who want to teach a language with people who want to learn them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I've been very fortunate. Um, I found someone I really like and work with, and she's so excited to 
work with poetry. It's just never done anything like that. And you know, we'll spend an hour on three lines that I learned so much and she learned so much. So it's yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna stop there because we could talk forever. I know. <laughs> okay. Um I'm not from there. <laughs> I am English, Irish, my uh, my grandmother's and aunt's claim we came over on the Mayflower and all of that there, D-A-R, all of that. I have no idea and I really don't care about that. Well, I have no Native American heritage. However, the, my mother was a Kennedy and yes, we're all related. And I'm a Wilson and yes, we're related. <laughs> so we have letters back and forth and all of them. So, um, but so English, Irish, Scottish, uh, Swedish, and French, and somebody was partying hard. Uh, <laughs> Iran. <laughs> so that was, I don't know where it came from, but it came from So uh, I'm a writer, I'm a poet, and I studied with. I was lucky enough to study with Van de Prima, Philip Whalen, and Allen Ginsberg. So, yeah. Wow, it's quite, a, it's quite a pedigree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you know, there's a story, there's an old story about uh, Brian Moore, who was the, the first king of Ireland to unite, the first Christian king to unite all the tribes of Ireland. And um, his father was uh, uh, Sinevi, which is Kennedy, Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And uh, Boru had a Christian wife and a Druid wife. And I claim to be one of the great, 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 great granddaughters of Boru. And uh, he was a healer, and uh, that's what I do. Okay. And she's my massage therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow. And maybe mine next week. Right? Maybe mine. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Did you bring any cards? I didn't do a lot of this in my life. Probably five different massage therapists over the years that I could call them. And she's absolutely the best. <laughs> and I try to go weekly. I have cards. This is amazing. Thank you. I love this. That's great. Sure, I will go next. My name is Tammy Phelps. You should come sit here or even there softly. I yeah. Yeah, yeah, put down your coat. Don't <laughs> <laughs> make Sandra more comfortable. Yeah, yeah. I can't I want to thank you. I think I'm going to use the word curate. That that is a fabulous word for me. Welcome information. I learned a great deal. I'm pretty overwhelmed. To tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Um, and thanks to Sandy for hosting and I'll see you home. Yeah, it's it's so it's an wonderful. But um, I don't know a great deal about my history. I'm kind of uh, excited to dig into that and learn a little bit more because I've really enjoyed all the stories that have been shared, just the 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 connections. And I know that that there's a lot there to learn. So I really don't know that much about it. But um, Carrie has told me, um, I'm here with Carrie Feldman, my husband, and he's told me that my last name Phelps means horse in Greek, so I'm part horse. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. something this guy was there oh Phelps do you know was he the guy that came to the school and blew on a, a 
Oh, he's invented instruments like crazy. It was a cool yes, connection. Yes. But, um, but anyway, I'm here supporting the arts, and it's um, a pleasure to be here. And I also want to thank Sandy. I see the books are out there, and my um, one of my art pieces is on the cover of Cirque by Carol. And so I contribute a lot of artwork and a lot of it in the. There's your photograph on my book, Drunk on Love. Yeah. Yes, with a rose next to it. See how I did that? There you go. So, anyway, I do appreciate the arts and I'm pleased to be here. I have fluffy. That's right. Fluffy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fluffy is so, so, but I've enjoyed all the stories and I'm inspired to find out a little bit more about new sites and courses. <laughs> we only have three Thank people you. left, and that's including Cynthia. I think we should get yeah. Cynthia next. David and Carrie. Yes. No, we're, we're going this way, so. You didn't want to move. Let's see. Because but, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not uh, in so far as I know. It's pretty much like Linda. Background. We're just saying who's still here. The same Mayflower. So maybe we have <laughs> oh, oh, there's a certain group where. <laughs> uh, but what, what I thought was interesting was this idea of a kind of a tribalism uh, in a broad sense. So Lithuanian. Polish and how these get sliced and diced with governments and, and the diaspora moving around. We've got all of that going on right now, you know, with Hispanics. But I mean, there's a lot of Africans coming to uh, the uh, southern border here, for example. And, you know, Alaska yeah. has, you know, an increasing group of West Africans working out and about. And then, you know, industries like the fisheries, you know, have. And, uh, because of our strange history with the Philippines and whatnot, oh, yeah, and yeah, they yeah. could come. So there's a lot of that going on, but one of the interesting things is this trying to maintain those connections and the languages. Of course, languages are disappearing, you know, indigenous languages like just like songbirds. You know? And uh, but it's interesting how there's this push to hang on to it or bring it back as as a uh, some of you have with the Lithuanian, and um, but then there's this the bigger move that seems to spread it out with wars and economics and drives people to go from one place to another, and families and all the awful things that go on. But I thought one of the interesting things about tribalism, or whether it's progressive or conservative within the same area of my tribe, is that on the individual level, people fall in love. They fall in love, just like your story mm -hmm. with Matilda, with, you know, the other tribe. The other and, tribe. Uh, you know, oftentimes those unite, as we've seen that around the world from pretty much everyone's story. So, I don't know, there's some kind of hope there. I, mm -hmm. I like the idea of these multiple languages and cultures, but I kind of like the idea of this integrate, but not lose uh, mm -hmm. thing. So, I don't know, just throw that yeah. out. Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. That reminds me of the pickle herring in my refrigerator because I'm trying to hold on to Norway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I used to love that. We should all have pickle herring in Well, I'm curious. And I love your presentation. I'm an anthropologist, and I, the last years and uh, Sandy has made me into a writer. Um, <laughs> I have some showers. This yes. is my, my new group. Well, I actually co-originated the Alaska Anthropological Association so four months after I came up here as a kid and uh, we came, came back from Fairbanks. I was a lot younger then and my, I said to Jack Love Bell at the community college, these people live far apart. Uh, <laughs> they don't get to see each other. Uh, they need a conference. He said, I was thinking that. And I said, they need an association. And it was born. And it's yeah. gone on for, I don't know, 55 years. And we tried to emphasize indigenous uh, perspectives and respect. And uh, I also started a master's program in fight anthropology. Again, to hit that. And you mentioned Seward. I have two papers that I'm writing now on Seward. 
yeah. uh, to get the native people into it who are trying to become a tribe. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and it's going to be interesting when people of Seward read what, what I discovered. Um, <laughs> You're they own the city. You tell. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they own that restaurant. They own the land. That's true. Yes. Well, they got exception. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to deal with them. <laughs> Well, I worked with their lawyer, and, 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 yeah, we've been doing 